Close your eyes. Imagine you're 22 years old, perhaps just out of college. You get a notice by mail or on your iPhone that it's time to serve your country. The service is voluntary, but expected, and all your friends are doing it. And you have choices. You can sign up for City Year, Teach for America, Habitat for Humanity, or the Peace Corps. Or you can enlist in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, or Marines. I think I got them all. Part of you is really excited for the adventure, where you will go, what you will do. You talk to people in the military, and you ask them why did they go into the military. They often talk about the adventure. Part of you knows that a year of national service can put you on a better path. And part of you knows that America needs national service to heal a divided nation. You see, America's torn apart. The data shows overwhelmingly we lack trust in one another and in key institutions. Young people lack opportunities across race, gender, income level, and background to come together in common experiences. Even the military, which for prior generations brought large swaths of the population together in a common mission, now turns away up to 75% of potential recruits due to poor education, poor behavior, and poor health. We see the effects all around us. Just pick up the papers. Distrust and violence and frain of American communities in places like Ferguson and Baltimore and Dallas and Chicago. Studies show anxiety and unhappiness among young people is on the rise. And Americans have lost confidence in their ability to tackle big challenges together. This wasn't the country I grew up in. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio on Drake Road, literally down the street from Neil Armstrong, this quiet and humble man who landed on the moon, and you can barely find a picture of him doing so. He was so focused on the mission. But he was a constant reminder to all of us of what Americans could do together when they came together around an audacious goal. Armstrong set the pace. I was inspired by him and the men and women of his generation to go into public service, but I got off track. I found myself in a corporate law firm in New York and Paris, and I had the audacity to write a letter to a public servant I didn't know, but I greatly admired. His name was Ted Sorensen. And I said, Mr. Sorensen, I find myself reading books on the Constitution and the Lincoln-Douglas debates, not how to merge companies or comply with securities regulations. And he wrote me this beautiful letter back. And at the end, it said, I hope your interest in public service will continue to burn brightly and be realized in due time. With his help, I found my way out and in unexpected places, from the corporate world to working for the most junior member of the lower house of Congress for half the pay. I know, not too bright. From a West Wing office shaping domestic policy for a president to a bunker below the White House on 9-11, helping to craft a domestic response to tragedy. From founding a company that I thought would work only with vulnerable youth in American cities to finding myself in villages in Africa. I was literally 41 years old before I discovered what I was built to do, and I had wished I had had this transformational national service experience at 22. We don't have a moonshot goal today, but I think America needs a big idea that plays to its strength. And I think that idea is universal voluntary national service. Imagine just for a moment young people coming of age, working with people who are different from they are, for a living stipend in tough conditions, solving big challenges. They could tutor and teach students in low-performing schools. They could conserve rivers and national parks or they could hang up malaria bed nets in Africa. National service could transform a generation. Consider the story of my now dear friend, Lashante Moore. She was homeless on the streets of Washington, DC, from Anacostia, a teenage unwed mother who had dropped out of high school. Her life prospects were really dim. 
But she found through word of mouth the Earth Conservation Corps, this fabulous national service experience that put her to work cleaning up the Anacostia River. And then on a small team of young people who literally brought the nation's symbol, the bald eagle, back to the nation's capital. And when I came here for this talk this morning, driving in with my daughter, I saw a bald eagle and thought of Lashante. And I remembered Lashante saying to me, you know, Previously, society viewed me as some problem to be solved. And after my experience through the Earth Conservation Corps, I realized I was potential to be fulfilled. Well, national service can do that for a generation. And there are millions of young Americans like Lashante who want to be put to work. So I can feel the vibration of skepticism. We have a Republican president, Republican majorities in Congress. And many of you are asking, well, Bridge, how do we bring this big idea to scale now? As a Republican who spent 20 years of my life promoting national service, I actually know that history's on our side. And given our divisions and how we're tearing ourselves apart, this idea is more urgent than ever. And we have a chairman, General Stanley McChrystal, who stepped up with so many other wonderful patriotic Americans to lead this important charge. My ancestors fought in the Battle of Gettysburg and the Wilderness Campaign, which personalizes for me Republican President Abraham Lincoln's words, it is for us the living to be dedicated to the unfinished work that they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It was two-term President Teddy Roosevelt whose bespectacled face appears on Mount Rushmore for his amazing conservation service legacy who said that in the end, success or failure will depend upon how we conduct ourselves in the ordinary affairs of life and how ordinary citizens respond to those cries that call for heroic virtues. When we serve today, we connect ourselves to those who preserved our union and advanced our freedom. And it was Teddy Roosevelt's cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, during the Great Depression that created the largest experiment in civilian national service in our history, the Civilian Conservation Corps. You may not know that Richard Nixon was actually the one that created the Senior Corps, our largest national service programs that engage about half a million Americans every year in their encore careers. It was Ronald Reagan, may surprise you, as governor of California, who created the California Conservation Corps under the oddly inspiring motto, low pay, tough work, miserable conditions. And all these young people signed up all over the country. <laughs> so we know the call to service works. It was President George H.W. Bush, who did the coin toss at the Super Bowl, God love him, and wrote a little note in that wonderful tradition to President Clinton and said, there's just one initiative across my entire administration I want you to continue. Guess what it was? The points of light. It was President George W. Bush after 9-11, who expanded AmeriCorps, a Clinton-era program, by 50%. And it was a tough battle with the Congress. Grew Peace Corps, a Kennedy program, to the highest levels in decades, really in the spirit of that wonderful Sergeant Shriver, and created a disaster preparedness corps in more than 1,000 communities across the United States. It was conservative Republican Senator Orrin Hatch, he was the first person to call me after 9-11 when I was in the White House from Capitol Hill to talk about national service. And he shared with me his Mormon mission that he had performed at a young age in the Great Lakes and how that informed the rest of his life and his 30 plus years of service in the US Senate. And he was the one who led the floor debate for the passage of what he then called the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act in a wonderful spirit of bipartisan statesmanship and friendship. You know, Republicans and Democrats alike have issued the call to service down the ages, and it has elicited sheer poetry. Kennedy's ask not, sounding the trumpet in the inaugural. Johnson's to guide the young, comfort the sick, encourage the downtrodden. It was Ronald Reagan, who went to the Republican National Convention and said, the spirit of service flows like a deep and mighty river through the history of our nation. It was President Bush 41 who said, a brilliant diversity spread like stars, like a thousand points of light. President Clinton, who said, we will restore our commitment to American community in our time 
and make affordable the cost of college for every American. And George W. Bush, after 9-11, we need citizens, not spectators, building on the gathering momentum of millions of acts of kindness and goodness and decency. On 9-11, I found myself in the President's Emergency Operations Center below the White House as terror and fear gripped the nation. And Secretary Norm Manana grounded every plane into the United States. But ultimately, within hours, the White House operators reported that thousands of people were calling all across the United States and the world offering to help. Our emails were lighting up with offers from friends and strangers to give a hand. In fact, in New York City, there was such a response of compassion and love from across the world that they had to hire a trucking operation to haul the excess of American compassion away because it was interfering with the response. So ultimately, our response was serving and caring for and loving one another in this difficult, difficult time. You know, as I look back now on, on the future, I, we see that facts matter. And as we try to bring money ball to government and make the effective case for national service, we're in a better position than ever. National studies show that national service reduces chronic absenteeism and boosts math and reading scores for students trapped in low performing schools. National service is actually a really effective response to disaster preparedness. There's something called the FEMA Corps. It actually mobilizes trained, talented people to respond to disasters and saves taxpayers $60 million a year. A program was started by the now governor of Missouri, Eric Greitens, who was a Navy SEAL, called The Mission Continues. And it had this big idea when veterans come back home, let's not view them as, oh, you've done your service, that's it. Let's view them as assets and resources for our country. And so the mission continued, and in turn, national service boosted the educational and employment and even community and family outcomes of our nation's veterans. Columbia University tells us that for every dollar invested, we get a $4 return on investment, services provided, educational and employment outcomes, and lower social welfare costs. Longitudinal studies. Anybody here serve in AmeriCorps or the Peace Corps? Oh my god, I love it. Quarter of the room. AmeriCorps members go on to vote and volunteer and serve in public service at far greater numbers than those who don't. So it has a huge civic effect. And when Bob Putnam talks about bowling alone, we can bowl together. AmeriCorps, the federal program that invests in national service, actually now awards bonus points to grant applicants that invest and follow proven practices, increasing that investment from about 19% in 2015 to 26% last year. And the Corporation for National and Community Service, which administers AmeriCorps, was featured in the Invest in What Works Index Scorecard, created by Results for America, which is providing an incentive across our entire government to have government dollars more rigorously follow things that actually work. We also know that the evidence is a powerful way to move the policy agenda and to continue this important work. Republicans philosophically may want to cut big government, but they support the little platoons of civil society that national service represents. And when Alexis de Tocqueville came to the United States in the 1830s to study America's prisons, he left marveling at America's institutions of civil society, inspiring this fabulous book called Democracy in America. Democrats want to ensure that government investments are effective, and so they want national service to have an impact on public problem solving. And both parties want to have priorities, rebuilding infrastructure, reintegrating veterans, helping vulnerable youth in inner cities, that national service is a powerful solution to. So I want to end with a call to action, and I want it to be a collective call to action. If you're the president or a member of Congress, you can become the first person in history to bring national service sustainably to scale. And our goal within 10 years on the 250th anniversary of the signing of the declaration is to grow national service positions from 65,000 opportunities for young Americans to a million 
a million full-time service year opportunities every year. If you're a leader in higher education, you can create service year fellowships and marry service with learning. As Sergeant Shriver's memo to President Kennedy in February 1961 indicates that he wanted to do, he wanted to run the Peace Corps through colleges and universities, but the infrastructure didn't exist at that time. It does today. And we have more than 200 colleges and universities that are creating service year fellowships and then awarding course credit in many cases to students who do it. If you're a business leader, you can make a person's national service record relevant to getting a job. So imagine you perform your year of national service, and that gives you a leg up in employment because you have grit and persistence and all the qualities, the social and emotional, as well as academic skills and real world experience that are relevant in the workforce. If you're a nonprofit leader, you can create service year positions and help meet your missions. If you're a young person, you can find a service year opportunity that meets your passion on the Service Year Exchange run by the Service Year Alliance at serviceyear.org and prove your prospects in the labor market. And if you're a young person who is disconnected from school or work or is formally in prison, you can do a service year and change your life. Imagine for a moment a country in which a young person has an opportunity as they come of age to work together with people of different races, ethnicities, income levels, backgrounds, even political and religious differences in common purpose, it would change their view of other people, their capacity and confidence in getting big problems addressed, and their love of country. They would learn to believe in things until they die, to develop ideas powerful enough to change the world, and to recognize as the founders hoped that the pursuit of happiness was a collective enterprise that we help one another achieve and that my life is interdependent with your life. Americans are mobilizing across this country for various reasons, and they're ready to serve causes greater than themselves. My dream for America is universal voluntary national service. Together, I hope we can make that dream come true and finally become one nation indivisible. Thank you. Thank you.